Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast, where I, your host, Dr. Jim Hoven, have the chance to visit with really cool people that do really cool things, and we get to hear their stories. So today, I have a really awesome guest. Her name is Julie. Julie Lyons is her name, and she's going to talk to us about bike racing, about how it's affected her life, where it started in her life, the things she's doing with it now, and it's going to be very, very inspirational. So hopefully this is going to be one that if you're into biking, you really connect with it. And if you've never experienced biking, you're going to hear something from a different perspective that you can appreciate and love. So uh, without further ado, Julie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. It is going to be so fun. And part of the reason that it's going to be so awesome is the way that you've come into this sport. Would you just give our audience a little background about what you were doing? Because you didn't start training as a, as a 10 year old in bikes. You had a whole life going on. And so bike racing came at a different stage of your life. Can you give our audience some background on that? So yeah, I, I am a pre title nine athlete is what I'd like to call myself. So I didn't really have the opportunity to do sports in high school and I, I always really liked it. Um, but we just, we didn't have it. The, the girls just didn't really participate. So um, I, I did my own thing. I, I kind of started out being a runner and did, you know, the usual 5K, 10K, that kind of thing. And in my 40s, I um, just wanted to be more active. And I, I discovered triathlon and just totally fell in love with the in love with the sport, you know, and I have the same story that everybody has when they first did triathlon, you know, you do it on your mommy bike that has the baskets on the back and you don't have any gear and, you know, you, you try to swim. I, you know, I got in the water to swim. I think I had been in the pool maybe three or four times. I'd never been in open water. And I remember going, I did it with a friend of mine who, who knew about triathlon. <laughs> and I remember asking her, you know, what do you wear? And she said, you're going to see people wear all kinds of things. There's not like a uniform, just wear what you're the most comfortable. So I wore my running clothes. That was the only thing I really did, you know? So I did the swim in my, except for my shoes. I did take my shoes off, but I had all my running gear on for the swim. And I, I remember thinking, I can't believe I have to get on my bike. I got on my bike and I was still in my running clothes on my bike. And then finally I did the run. And the minute I crossed the finish line, my first thought was, I, I know I can do better than this. Wow. <laughs> and so it kind of lit my fire and it kind of, um, I think the one thing, the biggest thing I learned out of my early triathlon career was actually from watching the guys. And I did a triathlon once at Cherry Creek Reservoir and I did it with this same friend and it was a wave start. So she started and it was, my wave was so far behind hers that I could watch her complete swim and go out to transition with her and kind of wave her off in the, on her bike. And I'm going, bye, bye, you know, don't forget to drink and I'll see you at the finish. And in my head, I'm thinking, I am going to beat you. Whoa. <laughs> but you can't say that. As a woman, right. you can't say that. And I turn around and here come these two guys barreling out of the pool and they're pushing each other and laughing and you know i'm gonna beat you and no you're not you have to catch me and they're laughing and having a great time and it occurred to me that competition is not a four-letter word that you can actually want to compete and feel good about competing and want to be the best that you can you can possibly be and i just sort of generalized that to to all the women i know there's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best you can possibly be whether it's in sport whether it's in your life whether it's as a, a parent whether it's in a job, that's not a bad thing. And Julie, were, did, were you always like that, that competitive spirit underneath? Like you said, you're pre-Title IX, so you didn't have a lot of opportunities, but was that thing welling within you or was that the moment where you're like, wait a minute? There's yeah, it, it was always in there. It was always in there. I wanted to compete and I felt like I shouldn't, you know, that I should except that you know everybody's equal and we're just having fun and competition is not a good thing and once i realized that yeah there's nothing wrong with wanting to compete that's right i think would you say this as a principle being a great competitor makes you also a better um opportunity in any way an opportunity to be a better sharer because like when you really give it and you lay it all out there you can understand and then share with others that experience the the wins, you, like you get to share that sometimes it makes you a better person than the non-competitive person that just sits back and lets everything happen to them or, or just waits for something to happen. What, have you seen that in your life? I, I think, and it's not only that, but it makes, it made me be more of a risk taker. 
like to make the leap from triathlon to bike racing, to make the leap from short distance to long distance. All of that's a risk. And, um, but it, I wanted to try and it was okay for me to want that <laughs> mm. and, and kind of what blossomed out of that. And I know we'll get, we'll get to that, but it made me want that for other women. Yes. Oh, so good. So you're doing, you're doing these triathletes, uh, these triathlons in your thir- in your forties. And then you, like you said, you decided to make the jump into bike racing. How did that come about? Was there something that you just loved about the bike more than the others? Or were you just better at the bike? What was the transition? Well, um, I had always ridden my bike, you know, but usually it was to get from place to place. You know, it wasn't like a race. And then uh, in in triathlon, I just started really enjoying my time on my bike and I liked trying to go as fast as I could. And what I liked about it is I could do it for a really long time. <laughs> and, and was that by training or is that a natural gift that you have? I think it's just something I'm just, there's, there's some people that are really good at going short and fast. And there's some people that are really good at going long and fast and, yeah. you know, you can sustain. So, um, I just started doing some time trial and some road races. And the next thing I knew, I had a friend who, it was kind of on a dare as most of these things happen, you know, and she said, do you want to do this race? It's called race across the West. It's 800 and well, it was 900 miles then. And this is how we do it. And I thought, what is this? But again, the, the idea of let's take a risk and try something new. And so I did that race. It was on a four women team. We were all over 50 when we did it. Um, we set the record for the race that still stands. And that was wow. in, 20, that was in 2010. So for 22 wow. years, that record still stands. And um, when I cross and the, the race, so the race, there's a race across the America that's 3000 miles. And then there's a smaller version within that race that's a race across the West. And so when we crossed the finish line, I just thought I'm not done. I am not done. I want to go farther and I want to do more. So I kind of got involved. And the next, the next year we did race across America, 3000 miles. And I just sort of thought, you know, I, I want to do this on behalf of, behalf isn't the right word, but with, I want to experience this with other women and I want to share this experience with other women. So my partners and I, we did a lot of fundraising. We got a lot of media. We really pushed ourselves out there. And there were so many women that contacted us via social media or via the internet to say, we can't believe you do this. You seem like a regular ordinary person. I said, I am. And this is what you can do. Ordinary people can do extraordinary things. It's it's not unheard of. So, um, I mean, there were women meeting us. There's there's things called time stations all along the route and they're predetermined. So everyone knows when someone's gonna be passed. There were women waiting for us at these time stations. There were women waiting at the end, you know, can you sign this for me? And, you know, I'm just me. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and so it kind of dawned on me that there was a way to take this type of experience and and share it amongst a bigger population. Well, we're going to get into that. I definitely want to want to go that direction, but I can't help but dive into something as a sports chiropractor and having done a lot of treated a lot of athletes, worked with a lot of athletes and and try to be, you know, engaged in sport myself. When you were training as you were going different distances, were you really conscious conscious of the difference between training for an 800 mile ride, a 60 mile ride and a 3000 mile ride? Did you have to change your diet, your periodization of your rides? And talk to me a little bit about that. Cause to me, the getting the mental and the physical right to be able to accomplish something like that, like you don't just get off the couch and do that. So I, I think people would be fascinated to hear the process, the thinking and the strategy that goes into those kinds of long races. Well, so I think the biggest strategy is, um, and I don't, I, I think I speak for just about every one, every athlete, you kind of get into a groove. You, you either get up and you exercise, and then you do your day, or you're the kind of person that you can't exercise first thing in the morning. So you do your day and then you exercise. And we did a lot of training at different times of day. Like you'd get up at two in the morning and ride for two hours. And sometimes I went outside in the summer. I just took a light and went on streets and and rode because I needed to learn that you actually can use your body at different times during the day than you think you can. Yes. <laughs> you know, sometimes I still get stuck there. It's like, oh, if I don't get my workout in first thing in the morning, then I'm not going to do it. 
but I know I can, I know I can do it at different, different times of the day. So that was the biggest, um, the biggest, um, change, I guess the, the adaptation. What, what about your, your ground training? Like, did you have to do a lot of different types of, um, off cycle, off bike work to be able to make your core stronger or to, to balance opposite muscles? Was that part of that kind of a ride too? Yeah. I mean, it's a comprehensive training plan. So you, you know, um, cycling is not a weight bearing sport, even though you kind of think you are because you're pushing so hard sometimes. So I did a lot of strength training. Um, and again, because I'm a woman, I wanted to make sure, and I was older, so I wanted to make sure that my bones were in good shape. So I did at least three times a week, lifted relatively heavy stuff. And then I really like running and swimming still. So I didn't let go of those swimming is like great for whatever ails you, right? If anything's sore, you go out and swim and you feel so much better after that. Yeah. <laughs> and I still ran a little bit. And then the bike, the biking itself was really balanced since it's, you have to still try to go as fast as you can for as long as you can. You had really long rides, but you also had shorter rides that you did a lot of interval training. So you could keep that speed, speed part up. That's something else. And, and so then one more aspect of that, or actually two more, one is nutrition and the second is mindset. So you address the mindset a little bit by saying, we're going to train in different parts of the day than what our bodies are used to. So that our mind says, Hey, you train when I tell you to train, right? I, I guide this bike. I guide this swim, not you right. body. We're, we're going to go on my count. But what, what about the dietary side for a long ride like that? 3000 miles or even 800 miles or 900 miles. And then, um, how you prepare yourself mentally. So this is really a great question because there's not a simple answer. <laughs> and I'm training a team right now for women who are going to do race across America. And they keep asking me, what should I eat? What should I eat? What should I eat? And it's so individual and it just depends on your uh, metabolism and what you can tolerate. And I, tr I have tried everything and I have finally come to realize that my body does best with solid food. So if I'm doing a really long race like that, I try to plan my nutrition that I still have conceivably a breakfast, lunch, dinner. So I have at least like three meals, if you call it that. And then I'll fill in in between with like electrolytes and some, some sports stuff, but not really, not on the long, not on the longer rides. I don't do a lot of the, you know, Gatorade type drinks. Right. Um, but some people are, some people you're saying they would do better on that kind of thing where their body seems to respond yeah. if something has less digestion. Yeah. There's a lot of people that can't tolerate solid food. And on something and I was telling one of my uh, athletes, cause she was asking me that. And I said, you know what, by day four, everyone wants a burger. <laughs> <laughs> How many days is it to, to race the West to race across the rest? Uh, uh, well, race across America took us six and a half days and, but race across the West took us less than 48 hours. Cause we were, wow. burning off. we were going and see to people like me, you think race across America is a, a week's event. Like yeah. for me, I'd be like weeks, but you just said under one week. Yeah. Six and a half days. And, but again, we're riding 24 seven. You are. Yeah. We don't sleep. How, how does it break down then? How, how do you know when to rest and do you rest as a team? If you're going as a team? No, we, we, we have four women and we split into two teams of two. And so kind of like how, um, Jerry and I did our cross set our cross state records. Yep. The two, the, there's two people that are resting in an RV. That's like, they're like a hundred miles away. The other two who are actively riding are taking 15 to 20 minutes. We call them pulls. So I'll ride for 15 or 20 minutes and my partner will be waiting down the road in a car. She gets out. The minute I get there, she takes off for 20 minutes. I get in a car and go around her. So you kind of relay back and forth. So that's why I'm saying it's a long race, but you have to go as fast as you can. With sprint, 20 minute sprints. And, and, and you're, you're a doctor. So you get this, we get no warm up and no cool down. Man, that blows my mind. Yeah. Now, yeah. has that led to a lot of, um, strains and that kind of thing? Muscle strains. Does that happen? Especially after you've done several of these, these deals yeah. and then you're rested for a while. Cause the next two do their thing. And then when you get back on for that first, that first hit, is that, is that where things can like get a little twingy? The first one is the hardest <laughs> you get off after the first one and you think, okay, yeah, that's not happened again. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and then you don't have a choice because here she comes and she's full on. So you're going full on too. <laughs> so, wow. Um, yeah, you know, we all have our little aches and pains, but I can't say that we we always took a massage person with us. So we would get a little massage like between shifts, but not for very long because you only have a certain amount of time to rest before you go again. Right. Now, it, was it the same format in the race across the West? Teams of four doing exactly like what you just shared? Yeah. But then you do yeah. doubles, right? You and Jerry Schimmel, who's a friend of mine who, if people um, are familiar with Jerry, he's the voice of the Rockies and the voice of the Nuggets for almost 30 years and an avid, avid bike racer. And I know that you guys are great friends and that's how I got connected to you was through him. You guys, like you mentioned just a little bit, uh, uh, just a little bit ago, you guys broke some records in the state, right? We've set five records um, going across the state. And tell us about those. So though the first one we did, uh, because actually Jerry was approached by a, a friend of his, a woman who lost a leg to cancer um, when she was an adolescent. And she really wanted to do some cy cycling. She can only do a hand cycle. She only has one leg, right? So she she wanted to do something important. You know, she just really didn't want to just ride her bike to the store. She wanted to make a difference in her life. I can really relate to that. And so Jerry asked me, he said, do you think there's anything we can do to help her reach this goal? I said, absolutely we can. There's never a no. So we, but we wanted to, so it's Jerry and me and her. So we thought we probably should have another male to kind of balance it, you know, balance the team. And we found a guy who um, was a paraplegic. He also rode a hand cycle. And so we trained them um, and we were trying to kind of find a race to do. And then I said, you know, why does it have to be a race? Why don't we set a record? And they really liked that idea. So we crossed Colorado um, from the Utah border to the Kansas border. And um, with two of them on hand cycles. And so Jerry was, you know, partnered with uh, one person on a hand cycle. I was partnered with the other person on the hand cycle. And we did that same thing, two by two by two. Yes. Oh, that sounds amazing. And so as, as you've transitioned now, You've gone from, you're, you're still racing, you're still doing all of these incredible things for the individual part that it brings you, right? Not the, not necessarily the accolades, but just the fulfillment and the drive and the com competition, all those things we talked about. But now you're involved with some other things and, and I wanna talk about that. One is Love, Sweat and Gears, which is a nonprofit. Can you tell us, cause you've brought cycling now in a, as a way to bring awareness and to, to lift people's spirits. T talk to us about Love, Sweat and Gears. So Love, Sweat and Gears was born because when we first started doing RAM, we would do fundraising for, for bigger nonprofits. And, uh, and honestly, I never really knew where that money went. You know, you make a donation and you don't really, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the nonprofits. It's just me as a control freak, didn't know what that was paying for. You know, was that paying for programming? Was it paying for a salary? Was it whatever? So I thought, you know, I'm going to make my own nonprofit so that I know where this money is going. I, I, I know. And not only that, but it will be geared toward cyclists as well as other nonprofits in the community, and it will support our community. So it's a little bit of a complicated um, business structure because through the nonprofit, we mentor uh, and train endurance racers, but they can't be doing it, the, I guess, the unspoken mission statement is that they need to do it in some way that be, that uh, enhances their community. So they usually find a cause that they really feel attached to and they fundraise on behalf of that cause. And then they do the race on behalf of themselves pretty much, right? Yes, <laughs> right. And so <clears throat> as I was looking through the website, I was interested to know, did you guys start this thing or was it around, like was this your brainchild and, and it yeah. started growing? Yeah. Okay. The first, the first year we did it, we did have a couple of guys that were, um, uh, uh, marketing type people. Yes. And so they helped us come up with a really great name, you know, love, sweat and gears. They, they said, this is, you know, your love of the sport. The sweat is the time you put into it. And the gears are, are how you mesh with the community around you. Wow. Yeah. And so that kind of resonated with us and, um, and people just love it. And we do stuff. I mean, not only do we do races and, and mentor people, but we we do uh, Friday afternoon rides with whoever wants to come, you know, and just get people out on their bikes and and ride. How big is the group? Uh, 
The people that ride with us, you mean, or just in general? In, in general, like if, if we're looking at Love, Sweat and Gears, is it something that you would be a member of? Like that you have a hundred members that are all part of this because you're mentoring, you're teaching, you're training, and then you're bringing people up. Like if I wanted to ride, you're gonna say, hey Jim, let me help you. Um, but you got to do it for your community. Is there a, a structure set up? Uh, you're a member of it or? Yeah, well, so we don't charge a membership, I guess. You know, we don't have a, like a membership fee. But if you were to come and say, you know, I really want to compete in this, uh, you know, 900 mile race. Can you help me do that? I'd say yes. And then I would train you. And then, um, but then we also have the community side that again, you don't have to be a member. So we probably have like, I don't know, 30, 40 people that know us and, come out on Fridays or sometimes on the weekends and just, just go for a ride. And those people aren't competing. So there, there's the competitive side and the non-competitive side. I see. And when I was looking through the website, I noticed that there was every year there was, it looked like a team. And by the way, you were on a lot of those teams of four yeah. that we're talking about. Does the, does the group have one official team for the year or could you have multiple teams through the year? Oh, we've had as many as three teams a year. Okay. Yep. So, so it's, yeah, look. we can do as many. Yeah, there just doesn't have to be one. I see. And so when you guys go out, is there, um, I noticed that you're, from what I could tell, there were about seven causes that you guys were representing. One is the Gaia Home, which I found fascinating because, uh, and you can explain it better than I, but it, it's where people are getting support from your efforts, even if it's indirectly, to work with end of life issues, right? Whether it's that person going through that themselves or their family members. Uh, the, I, I'm interested to see why you pick the, the causes that you pick. I don't know if you wanna highlight Guy or talk about a few of them or, or what would work for you there, but it's just fascinating because there's a variety of causes yeah. in that seven I saw. So, so those are, again, those are nonprofits that really had meaning for the racers. So this year we have four women from North Dakota who are racing. One of them is executive director of Gaia Home, which is an end of life um, uh, facility, but it hasn't even been built yet. So they're fundraising uh, in order to uh, contribute to the general campaign fund of Gaia Home. And so they, they all live in Bismarck. It's a kind of a small community. Everyone is so excited about this Gaia Home that they're jumping on their bandwagon and they have fundraised an incredible amount of money and they they're using their Ram race as their basically their platform. And as of yesterday, they just got their local TV station on board with them. They're gonna be filming every morning of the race and, and broadcasting it on their local, you know, their local morning news show. Wow, and when is the race? The race is June 18th. So it's coming up, won't be long, just a few months. Yeah, yeah, we're almost there. That's exciting. And so with, with the group, is that something then that, how, how often when you're working with a group that's supporting a cause like this, what's the time commitment for you and the, the team at Blood, Sweat and Gears? So, or Love, Sweat and Gears, sorry, Blood, Sweat and Gears. Uh, that's if you wreck, it's Blood, Sweat and Gears. Yeah, so they're, they're busy training. I'm, tra I'm, I'm giving them a training plan. So they train, they do the fundraising in their community. I, and this is the first time we've had no, I can't say that it's a, well, I'll just say it's the first time we've had an entire team that lives somewhere else. Usually maybe there's one or two riders that live, that doesn't live locally. And by locally, I mean in Colorado, but their entire team is in North Dakota. So they're, they're on their bikes and they are fundraising and they are doing events and they are contacting sponsors. And I'm doing all the facilitating here, you know, figuring out the budget, um, giving them training plans, monitoring the bank account, getting the kits ordered, finding their vehicles, you know, all the, the behind the scenes. Wow. And you know, you never think about that. I was, um, I'm not much of a, of a bicycle person. Like I loved a mountain bike. I don't do it as much as I would like to, but I love it. And road bike has never been something that I've done, but I was asked to, as a volunteer effort, if I would help be a SAG driver, which for the people that are listening that don't know, um, basically support and gear, right? And for, yeah. for one of the races, the triple bypass here in Colorado, which, you know, yeah, that was a big one. And so it was so fascinating to me as my wife and I were basically carrying riders in different places and carrying their stuff and do not think all the support that goes behind an event, that's 120 miles. And there's a lot that goes to it. When you're talking about hundreds, a thousand or thousands of miles, 
Matt, walk us through what you have to look at, because you just kind of opened the curtain to it a minute ago with the North, yeah. North Dakota folks, but man, what a stage process it is to make it happen. It's really complicated because you have to have a crew of people and they'll have a crew of 12 and they'll have three vehicles, one RV and two vehicles that they'll need to be using on the road, basically for the racers. So you have to coordinate. First of all, you have to find the right people who are willing to take a week or you know two almost two weeks off if you consider by the time you get to the race and you get home because it starts in oceanside and ends in annapolis so you have to travel to the race <laughs> you have to get all the vehicles out there you have to get everybody's food out there you have to get uh um everybody's clothes you know everything all their electronics the cords the plugs <laughs> wow <laughs> it's the recharge stuff so i help them with that structure you know to figure out so they'll have yeah they'll have 12 12 crew members two groups of six, because six of them will help two riders, that are, two racers that are racing, the other six will rest with the other two, and then they switch out like that. Um, they'll have someone who drives the RV, someone who handles the food, and it's, it's a lot of coordinating. So that's the part I kind of help them with. So cool. And you know, you also help people in a different organization. And again, I love your passion for women. You've, you've mentioned that several times throughout our time and you're with the Colorado Wild Women's Group. Right. And from what I understand from looking at it, that is, that is a training event. That's, that's where if you're a woman and you say, I wanna get into this sport, whether it's triathlon or whether it's one of the bike events, you have a, a group of coaches and it looks like there's a, a stacked set of you guys from me looking through the, the website last night. Um, like it's serious business. So is that for the person, like you said earlier, that just has the, the bike with the little tassels hanging off it that wants to start, is that who you look for to help? Yes, we do. We look for the, we look for those women who the, the hardest part of the whole thing is for them is actually getting from the locker room to the swimming pool in a swimming suit. You know, they just haven't done it. They just aren't comfortable with their bodies. Most of them don't have any type of athletic background, but they want to do it and they want to feel safe and they want to, they want to learn how to compete. And so you then offer them that strategy. You teach them, you give them technique, whether it's running, swimming, or biking, because all of them have separate but really important technique issues. You show them that, you train with them, and that's more of a thing where they sign up with you, right? If that's what they want, they yeah, get a coach? That's a definite team. Yeah, that's a team. And then we've got several coaches. And um, and and we had when I was the head coach there, we had uh, probably a third of the team were cancer survivors. And I don't really know exactly how that we we never, you know, pandered to the cancer community or tried to attract them. But we had like maybe a couple athletes, and it just grew to where we had a third of our athletes were cancer survivors, and not just breast cancer, all kinds of cancers. And it it kind of went from the cancer survivors to friends or family of the cancer survivors because <laughs> they all got so much joy out of using their bodies yes oh that's fantastic and so you again everything that you're doing it's so neat to me julie it's, it's got a platform there's a there's a messaging to it besides just the activity and i think when you blend the message of inspiration and hope hard work competition, when you put all that together, I think you're just making a better human and a better life experience. Like literally that's what I'm hearing as, I, as I'm listening to the story that you're sharing today. Yeah, and I, I kind of think it's almost by, like empowerment, you know, because a lot of these women that do it feel, I just had a, another athlete of mine the other night, we were at the Sports Women of Colorado annual banquet and she said she feels like she can do anything now. You know, I trained her to do an Ironman and she said, I feel like there's nothing I can't do. And that feeling is such a great feeling, isn't it? When you it feel so great. empowered. Yes. And to be able to do that, I, I've often said that one of the biggest ways to understand what's capable in life for someone is channeling it through the physical because the physical gives you such rapid feedback. Now, if you, you know, if you've got a hundred pounds to lose, you don't lose all hundred. That's not fast, but you can lose two right away. So you get really rapid feedback as to whether it's working or not. And then you can build momentum. You learn to shift gears, change plans, like all that. It's just the, the physical to me is the platform for the mental, emotional, and spiritual journeys that we can take because we, we get such rapid feedback. I agree. I sign all of my emails with the word BAM, B-A-A-M. And it stands for a block and a mailbox 
because that's how you train. I'm going to go one block more today. I'm going to go my one block and a mailbox. And the next day you go one more mailbox. <laughs> that is brilliant. Bam. I like it. Block in a mailbox. That is so spectacular. Hey, I, I, I want to ask you this. Um, is there any piece of advice, because you, you've done so many things, any piece of advice that you have for someone who says, it's too late for me? I, you know, I, I haven't been an athlete or I was an athlete and I haven't done anything for 30 years. I'm now in my, in my 40s or my 50s or even my 60s. I, I don't know what I could do. Any advice that you would give these folks? So my time with CWW has a little bit morphed. I still work some with the cancer survivors, but now I'm working with, we call them the grand masters. I like it. And they're, <laughs> and they're women over 60 who want to be active, but they can't find a place to be active, right? Because they don't want to work out at the gym with all the 20 year olds. They don't want to swim with people that aren't their age. They, they're, they're not, they're misunderstood, but they want to use their body. And so I always say, then let's do it. That's my best piece of advice. So people that say I'm too old, I can't, or you see the occasional 90 year old track star. Wow. She's one of a kind. They're not one of a kind. They're one, we're one of everyone. And if there's something that you want to do, you just find the resources and you make it happen. Mm, and, I yeah. love that. And you know, I think what you hit on that's just solid gold there is when you said, Julie, find the resources and make it happen. Cause I think one of the things that keeps people, I mean, I'm in my mid fifties, and so many of my peers aren't training or doing anything and it's because they lack the confidence and they lack what they think is the knowledge that they need. Well, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't take a lot of training to go for a walk for one more block or one more mailbox, right? BAM can apply at every level. But I think once you get that part started, then you say, what do I want to do and who do I need to coach or train or you know, who do I find as a resource? in order to allow me to grow faster, have that safe environment, have that structured support so that I can succeed. And, and what you're doing and acting as a mentor for so many people, I just, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. So I love that advice. Oh yeah, yeah, it's great, it's great. And once people get, and I think too, I don't know if you find this, but I find that as we age, I have a lot of women that say, they, they, it starts with, I can't do that anymore, or so-and-so, so it's easy for so-and-so, but not for me. And I always have to say, why do you compare yourself to other people? That's, that's not what this is about. You're you. So you are going to be the best you, not relative to anybody else, just relative to who you are. So good. Yeah. And it's just like a little light bulb. And they're like, oh, okay. That's how that works. That is so good. I love that so much. I got to ask you this on the, the topic of advice. Is there any piece of advice that you've either learned along the way or was given to you at some point across your life that is now a, it's just a pillar, a centerpiece of how you go about doing your business? Anything that just sticks out as like, yeah, if I could offer one thing that I've learned or, or that it was shared with me to help people, this would be it. I think my one piece of advice was uh, just basically don't look at anything as a roadblock, look at things that get in your way as more of a speed bump that you can get over and just go. Mm, just go, go do that 20 minute sprint. Just get after it and rest when you need to. Yeah. And things that make you feel like you can't, you actually can't. It's not as big as you think. The obstacles are not as big as people think they are. Oh man, that is something. And Julie, this has been an inspiring time for me. Such a wonderful time. I can't thank you enough for sharing part of this beautiful snowy day. I know we were supposed to be together in person, but the weather here in Colorado got a little kooky today. And so we decided to do it in this format and just what a treat and having that nice warm fire in the background that you have makes me feel toasty. <laughs> but um, if people wanted to reach out to you, women in specific, if, if men wanted to reach out to learn more and how they could maybe share this with women they love or, or get involved in some way or women wanted to learn more, how would they reach you? So, and let me just say that we've had a lot of men because at first I was like, this is only for women. And then I've had men say, well, can I? And I'm like, well, yeah, this is an equal opportunity. <laughs> All right. So I can still do it. Yeah, I coach a lot of men too. And we have men in our group, but they would reach me at my Gmail, which is love, sweat, and gears, all spelled out at gmail.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, any last thoughts or any, uh, anything from you, Julie, to, to inspire people further than you already have today? 
<laughs> well, I think I've pretty much said everything. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. And I'm really happy to get involved with anyone who wants to give me a, give me a shout on the email. That'd be great. We will do it. Make it happen. Continued success to you. Continued love from this side to you guys. And I'm just so, so thankful that now I can call you a friend and I can't wait to keep track of how you're doing. Yeah, me too. Take care. Thanks All a right. lot. Thanks, Julie. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.